Uh, very welcome to Uppsala and this conference, Roof Trusses as Historical Sources. Uh, my name is Christina Persson. I work at the Sh Church of Sweden here in Uppsala. Uh, I've been in contact in with many of you that are going to, uh, are going to speak today. Uh, we are around 60 people, some are sick, uh, but I think we'll ended up around 60. Uh, the Church of Sweden are one of the organizers of this uh, conference, together with the Swedish Academy of Letters, History and Antiqu Antiquities and the Swedish National Heritage Board. So I'm one of the organizers together with Anders. Um, Anders Andrén. Um, representing uh, the Royal Academy of Letters, History and Antiquities uh, and Professor of Archaeology and previously Professor of Medieval Archaeology, been working with churches, among other things. And Maria Rossipal from the Swedish National Heritage Board. And unfortunately we are missing uh, Ann-Kathrin Bonnier, researcher, uh, she was sick, uh, she turned sick this, uh, this uh, weekend and now she's in hospital. So <laughs> she, we've been planning this event for over a year now, so it's really sad. Uh, but it's recorded, as you know, uh, so we film everything. And this microphone is only for the, the film, so that's why it does, you don't hear it. <laughs> Uh, so everyone that speaks here had to wear uh, this or a uh, muga, <laughs> what do you call it? <laughs> uh, but for the for the filming, I was going to tell you a little about the the committee uh, for research on churches. Uh, we are represented rep representatives for this committee. It was established 2016. And it's a cooperation between our three organizations. And the aim is to promote and coordinate research and knowledge uh, of building, knowledge building on churches. So this committee uh, is a kind of successor of the research company Swedish Churches, Sveriges Kyrkor, that started to publish uh, monographs uh, on churches in 1912. And this is our first conference. <laughs> Maybe we will uh, have more in the future. Um, and we're very glad to have you all here. Uh, one of the aim uh, of the conference is to present, discuss and compare research about uh, roof, roof, constru roof constructions of medieval churches in Northern Europe and Western Europe. But we know that this is a large interest in all over Europe. Uh, not, not only in Sweden, but we couldn't fit in more than this, so <laughs> we have uh, some parts uh, you're going to hear about these during these 24 hours. Uh, but one aim was also to meet uh, live, and not to, to see everything on the screen. Uh, so we decided that if it's not going to be live, we're not going to do it. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, something more? Or should we introduce our moderators? <laughs> Gunnild Eriksdotter and Gunnar Almevik. I'm going to take care of you for the rest of those <laughs> these days. Welcome. Thank yes. you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and you have the... Yeah, we have this handy <laughs> little... And you what will do you call it? Bug? <laughs> no? Bug, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you will introduce each other. Oh yeah, we will. Yeah, uh, we more will. or less. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So we start. Yes. Uh, yeah, we are Gunnhild and Gunnar. You can address us Gunn if you <laughs> don't remember our names. So we will take care of uh, uh, the program. Uh, and we are excited. We are here 60 participants uh, in this fantastic venue. And uh, we think it's worth noting that we are both academics and practitioners 
and we represent very different stakeholders from the whole cultural heritage ecosystem, from the universities, the heritage board, uh, the, sui the church organizations, uh, practitioners, entrepreneurs, craftspeople, consultants. So uh, we are diver diverse, uh, but still uh, we think that we might share some uh, important experiences. We think maybe many of us uh, have the experience of being in a medieval church trust, mm. uh, sharing the experience, the challenge of getting there, of being there, the sensation, the smell maybe, uh, the obscurity. Like uh, the <laughs> yeah, the curiosity of possible findings, mm. this kind of sense of connectivity to the past and the the time gap apprentices that we are. So we are excited when we have a full program ahead and we can expect insightful presentation and with all of us helping out intriguing discussions. So my name is Gunnar Almevik. I'm professor in conservation at the University of Gothenburg and researcher at the Crafts Laboratory in Mariestad. And my name is Gunhild Eriksdotter. I'm a historical archaeologist or medieval archaeologist, how you want to put it. I'm specialized in buildings archaeology. And at the moment, I work as a part-time researcher in Uppsala, in this house, just around the corner. And I have the honor to present the first lecture here. It's a person who has a PhD in art history. He has a long experience working at the National Heritage Board, uh, mainly with uh, medieval parish churches. Right now, he's working as, uh, at the head of uh, the cultural heritage uh, support at the Church of Sweden here in Uppsala. And I'm delighted to say welcome to Marcus Dahlberg, who is going to talk about medieval roof trusses in Sweden and Europe managing an important cultural heritage for the future. You're welcome, Mar Marcus. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm also very excited to, to meet you all. I know some of you, but others not. Um, as we've heard, we are here for 24 hours. And we... Uh, um, or to get an overview and be inspired by current research on medieval roof trusses. Uh, I am personally very happy about the interna our in international guests because I think we need uh, sometimes an outside view to understand our piece of the puzzle. My ambition here is to briefly give an overview of medieval church building in Sweden, uh, which of course provides uh, an important conditions, condition for the presence and variation of roof trusses. I will conclude with some thoughts from my own point of view on the characteristics of this heritage and finally about the importance of managing it for the future. This is a map from a project run by the National Heritage Board called the Parish Churches Heritage and Settlement History. The main aim of the project was to provide a quantitative picture of church building from the Middle Ages to the middle of the 20th century and how different periods characterize the church expansion and the church landscape that meets us today. The church landscape reflects a history of colonization from the Middle Ages to modern times. Landscape types and growth of population have affected density and chronology of church buildings. 
In these maps, you can see two of the stable geographic factors. You can see two stable geographic factors, namely the highest coastline. That is the line where the Baltic Sea stood at its highest, under and after the inland, inland ice. And on the other map, you can see the presence of calcareous soils. The successive expan expansion of ecclesiastical heritage is only one part of the story. Over time, churches have also been demolished and replaced with new ones. Also here we can find connections to agrarian history. The many churches that were built on the plains of Götaland during the 19th century, here seen as small yellow dots, have a clear connection with an increase in population dependent on agricultural reforms and intensive farming. In Sweden, as elsewhere in Europe, wood, wood was often used for the first church on the site. However, in Sweden, early medieval wooden churches are only known through archaeology or through wooden parts that have been reused in a stone church built at a later stage. <clears throat> the stone church is a legacy of the Middle Ages. The Swedish medieval churches follow a design contemporary with European development in general. The Romanesque church has a distinctive plan with a nave and a narrow chancel, sometimes with an apse in the east. A western tower was sometimes added. In the middle of the 12th century, excuse me, in the middle of the 13th century, another building type made its breakthrough. The Gothic Hall Church, consisting of a rectangular nave without a separate chancel. The building type dominated throughout the Middle Ages. In the individual case, a building history can be very complex. It is often only possible to determine the relative chronology. To date, the various building phases, we are usually referred to stylistic features, which are not always at hand. However, here in Glan Summer Church, we can identify a Romanesque nave with a western tower, a remodeling and extension during the 13th century. Finally, during the late Middle Ages, it received a two-nave hall-shaped plan and the church was faulted throughout. By compiling chronology with building features, for example, the ex existence of apses and western towers, we may conclude that the Romanesque churches are found in Sweden's most favorable settlement districts, in the center of Götaland and Svealand. To the left you can see some plans of originally Romanesque churches from the district Östergötland, that in some cases were later rebuilt and sometimes not. As a result, it is in these central parts of Sweden that larger clusters of Romanesque stone churches with medieval roof trusses are preserved. Compared with other countries in Western Europe, the number of early medieval trusses is relatively large. 
there are variants of types that have been spread over large parts of Europe during the same period. However, there are also several features that are not otherwise found in Europe. And I think we will hear more about these things during the day. A church made of stone was a permanent building. But nevertheless, it usually went through several stages of change during the Middle Ages. Regional variances in this regard is obvious. In the central districts of Götaland, many well-built Romanesque stone churches retained their main design throughout the Middle Ages. Parish formation continued during the Middle Ages, north of Lake Mälaren and along the coast of Norrland. New hall churches were built. At the same time, many of the existing churches in Svealand were rebuilt in the same fashion. This process of rebuilding began during the 13th century and continued throughout the Middle Ages. A distribution map of churches with this type of building plan demonstrates a clear shift in emphasis to the eastern parts of Sweden. <clears throat> As already mentioned, the shift is partly due to colonization. However, from the early 12th century, stone churches were built both in the central parts of Götaland and Svealand. Overall, from the 13th century to the end of the Middle Ages, it seems that conditions for reshaping the existing building stock were more favorable in the eastern parts of Sweden. In, dis in discussing reasons behind this, we cannot only look to geographical and economical uh, conditions. We must also see this in the context of contemporary political and ecclesiastical change. The timber crafts that are found in Eu European architecture from the Gothic period with vaulted ceilings and elaborate trusses can be found in Swedish churches from the 13th century to the 15th centuries. Uh, and those of you who are going to Tensta church tomorrow will see one magnificent example of this. Looking at the overall picture at the end of the Middle Ages, and the distributions of churches built in wood and stone, we see the result of a complex development. We have traces of early wooden churches in the central districts, which were replaced by Romanesque stone churches already in the 12th century. Church building in wood and stone continued throughout the Middle Ages. And by the end of the Middle Ages, wooden churches remained in some regions. The majority of these were timber churches, probably of a relatively late date. Today, only 10 medieval wooden churches remain partially preserved. Regardless of whether the church was built in wood or stone, the roof construction was always wooden. In Sweden today, there are approximately 1,300 fully or partially preserved medieval churches, of which the vast majority, as already said, uh, are built of stone. Just over 400 of them remain quite intact in their original layout while the rest have been rebuilt in one or more stages. In the best preserved churches, you can, fi you can find trusses 
which can be dated to the time when the, when the church was built. In others, you can often find reused material that can be associated to the church's older building phases. Then, what characterizes the medieval roof trusses as heritage? I would like to highlight some aspects given this background. Christianization was a radical transformation of society and landscape. The establishment and organization of the Christian church in the 11th and 12th centuries went hand in hand with central power claims and the formation of states. I dare say that we have neither before nor since seen such a radical and permanent change to the built environment. And this change is still visible throughout the churches that still stand. Quite a lot of the datings of trusses in standing Romanesque churches belong to the middle and latter half of the 12th century. Overall, it is not a picture of steady, leisurely expansion. The impression is rather a concentrated building effort, a manifestation of the victory of the Christian faith and transformation of society. Church building and trusses are primary sources to this change in society that was currently taking place throughout Europe. The medieval trusses are traces of people who, with knowledge and experience, found solutions to technical challenges and, at the same time, gave it a design that not only strived for the practical, but also responded to an experience of the beautiful. Beauty varies over time and, the, and also the meaning of beauty. Of course, this could also be said about the church building itself. In a series of studies in Scandinavia, church building during the 12th century has been interpreted as part of a parish formation process. The general picture involves a development from early privately owned buildings constructed by the elite to a more formalized parish formation in which the parish itself emerged as a possible commissioner. Social and economic factors have been stressed as explanations to when and how the church was built. These studies have emphasized the worldly benefits that the commissioner achieved by allying to the church. In many ways, this picture is credible, but should perhaps be modified to better understand the driving forces. Building and decorating a new church was ultimately a desire to manifest faith in deeds. Contemporary sources which would make possible to understand these individual beliefs and mentality during the Middle Ages are scarce and elusive. In a theoretical framework for the interpretation of the church building, however, these aspects should be considered. How else are we to understand why such care was taken on things that were barely seen by the human eye? Medieval roof trusses are not just historical remains. Here we can find experience and experiences and lessons learned that are important for contemporary construction and management not least in view of today's focus on sustainability. The parishes in Sweden manage a variety of historic buildings that was formed using local building materials and know-how. 
In fact, this is one of the most important qualities of the ecclesiastical heritage. Even if the church later was built in stone or brick, a traditional craft in wood has shaped other significant parts of the church construction or be used for other buildings in the church environment. The use of wood has not only been determined by available tree species, but also knowledge on suitable wood for specific parts of the construction. The church buildings are truly an archive of traditional woodcraft, which can be, which can be folded from the Middle Ages until at least the middle of the 20th century, when general changes took place in the building process. What then are the conditions for taking care of this heritage for the future, and for whom is it is important? In a European context, um, uh, and in all European countries, there is an awareness of the importance of religious heritage for understanding history. The term religious heritage is deliberately chosen. Europe's cultural identity is associated with the Christian church, but overall and over time we find a great religious diversity. This is also reflected in the legislation regarding the management of religious heritage in Europe. There are similarities, but also differences, depending on history and the religious community's position in society. The Church of Sweden, through its, its parishes, manages around 3,000 church buildings, protected by the Swedish Heritage Act. The state, compensation, uh, the state compensates the Church of Sweden financially for managing this cultural heritage. Um, and the funds can be partly used for inventories uh, and, uh, uh, or service that improve the conditions for preservation. Several studies of medieval roof structures has, has, have been carried out by the dioceses. The Craft Laboratory at the University of Gothenburg has been commissioned by the Church of Sweden at national level to compile these findings. And we will hear something uh, said about the, this, uh, this service also. It is of great importance that up-to-date knowledge is produced and made available to those who manages the church buildings, namely the parishes. And these inventories that I mentioned have been partly financed by the Church of Sweden and partly by this state uh, compensation. So knowledge of roof trusses is not just a question uh, uh, for the church, of course. It's a matter, it, it matters to us all. It is often said that we know too little, but that is perhaps not always the problem. In fact, we, co we know quite a lot about the quality of churches as heritage. However, it is often a disturbing, disturbing gap between what we as experts know and what we manage to mediate to property man managers, users and visitors. The Church of Sweden collaborates with other parties, for instance, the National Heritage Board and the Royal Swedish Academy of Letters, History and Antiquities to fund and make available new knowledge to both researchers and the public. And this conference is an example of this. I will conclude there and I hope that these days will bring both new knowledge and shared experiences. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus. Maybe you want to stay a few minutes here if we have any questions from the audience. Thank you so much for this illustrative overview that we needed and the uh, objective of this conference. If not, I 
hand over to yeah, Gunnar. And we will uh, welcome the next speaker, Robin Gulbranson, please. Uh, I would say here is the spider in the web, and possibly <laughs> the one who knows everybody in this room, or almost. <laughs> Soon after this. Soon <laughs> after this. Yeah, you will be very popular at the castle tonight. <laughs> Robin is an archaeologist and building conservator at Vestiotlas Museum. He is also a PhD student at the University of Gothenburg. And he has been engaged in these surveys of medieval timber roofs since 2010. And now you will share your reflections on the results. Yes, 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> can we make the presentation bigger? Yeah, so it's quite a challenge to try to summarize uh, what has been done in Sweden in these uh, uh, diocese run surveys. In, well, we are now on the 11th, almost the 12th year of these services. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, so <coughs> thank you, Marcus, for the introduction uh, and the background to this service, uh, which were funded by the state and the Swedish church uh, and started in 2010 and is still ongoing. So these results are quite prelimi preliminary and uh, uh, very sketchy, uh, I must say. Uh, well, why is it's so interesting with church ethics, apart from being dirty and hard to get at, being like uh, those people going into caves. They don't do it just for fun. Uh, well, it is a fact that many of these church ethics has, have changed less than the church interiors, which has been uh, objects of modernizations in several periods. And as thus, they are quite authentic archaeological sources. And what's special in Sweden is that we have so many uh, preserved original trusses, especially in the high medieval churches of the 12th century. Uh, today we know of at least 160. Of course, now there are more because the surveys are ongoing, for example, in Småland. Uh, so this is... a. Uh, concentration that is quite unique in Europe and uh, as Marcus said they are also proof of a very sustainable construction they have sustained more than 800 years of care but also neglect wars and so on and of course we can gain much knowledge about the techniques once used in building them and also on material resources and architectonic ideals. And well, these documentations aren't the first ones, but uh, some things have been done earlier on, and this is just a short summary thereof, uh, with the uh, inventorization Swedish churches, for example, uh, predecessors in this research as Peter Schömer and Ola Storsletten, who is with us today as well, uh, Kina Linskott and others, and the birth of dendrochronology in the 80s, where the church trusses were very much used to build up reference series. And of course, we have uh, the project of Södra Råda, the reconstruction of this burnt down 14th century timber church, we saw a photo of, which also raised questions on medieval techniques. So this is what have been done or is ongoing um, by very dirty map of <laughs> what's been made or ongoing in Sweden. Uh, it started in 2010 with a kind of a pilot project in the southern part of Linköping diocese in this part of uh, Småland. Uh, I headed out to 11 churches and tried to find a way of how can you in a short time get enough information to make uh, characterization of a roof structure. Is it medieval? Uh, are there any values? And that led to several diocese projects and some still ongoing and maybe some will come because we haven't still covered all of Sweden. And uh, some of them have also been made in 
def several steps. First, making a survey uh, to conclude what's preserved, and then selection of case studies and dating, making datings. And of course, this, the roof structures are, as the church uh, building uh, in its entirety, a reflection of the history and preconditions that have uh, governed. And uh, well, the state of preservation is very diverse in diverse parts of Sweden. In the Diocese of Gothenburg along the west coast, only some 30% of the medieval churches still have medieval roof constructions. In Strängnäs, we have uh, preserved roof structures in 80% of the churches. In both cases, the roofs are mainly late medieval, but in the Diocese of Skara, we have 70% uh, of the medieval churches with preserved roofs and roofs from the 12th and 13th centuries. So uh, it's a reflection of how different parts of Sweden had different histories and changes and uh, resources throughout the Middle Ages and later. So a bit about the methods of the diocese surveys and investigations. As I said, the first step was to see what is preserved out there. So four hours, half a day for a church to see is there anything of interest, making photo documentation, a protocol, standardized, simple measurings and drawings. And out of this you could get research questions and being able to select cases for deeper studies, uh, then really making these studies as cross-disciplinary teamworks with uh, buildings archaeologists, craft researchers, carpenters, dendrochronologists, and also other people as engineers and so on. Uh, and uh, well, could dive deep into one roof or two during one or two weeks and uh, really look into uh, tool traces, uh, the material properties of the timbers, and uh, better knowledge of the building archaeology, and of course searching for suitable timbers for dendrochronology, which was the last step in each of these cases uh, to test our hypothesis and sometimes also revise them. And also not just looking for felling dates, but also uh, get knowledge about uh, provenance, character of forests, and so on. And uh, well, this is hard to conclude, <laughs> uh, but we have some features in common. That's usually an indication of medieval uh, structures. This is 500 years. Uh, and of course, it's a big difference between a roof from the 12th century and one from the uh, early 16th century. But one thing in common is normally we have the square, square cut timbers, nice scantled, very seldom we find veiny edge or uh, the late wood. We have, of course, a variety of different uh, axes and hewing techniques, uh, but one alarm bell always is when we find the so-called spretthuggening, which you can see examples of to the left and Matthias making a new spretthuggening, uh, which actually you work along the, the fibers of the wood and it's normally a knife grinded ax and you get a very characteristic uh, almost fishbone pattern when you look at it in oblique lightning. Uh, these, this kind of technique we don't normally find after the mid 14th century. After the mid 14th century normally you find variety of broad axe and so on working across the timbers. It's of course a simplification. A uh, common thing in the early roofs are the very tight sp spacing of one L more or less. Um, and of course we also have in the old roofs from the Romanesque period, normally tie beam trusses. Uh, and the use of a template for building trusses is something that appear much later in the 14th century and on. And of course we later get other uh, 
things to solve when they, with the introduction of wooden ceilings and uh, vaulted stone and brick ceilings that demand other types of constructions. And uh, then we have a new input of techniques from the continent. So this is the state of 2020 uh, of roofs from before 1250. Now we have even more that we could put in, but at least 160, I guess we have at least 170 or a bit more now. Also, there are some few fragments from the 11th century in Scania mainly. So just some nice pictures to look at from the early 12th century. Uh, I will dive into this matter tomorrow and have some more time uh, to show the diversity of roof constructions that can be found for this part in, in Westergötland during the early period. And uh, well, the late 13th and the uh, 14th century, we don't have that much, but this, what we have is quite interesting because here we really see how old and new start to intermingle and mix and new techniques are developed. And we also find the introduction of these wooden vaults and sometimes maybe also wooden vaults without a cover, covering ceiling. Normally we just have a skeleton now, but in the historical museum you have one intact roof reconstructed. And of course, late medieval time uh, is also a big input of influences, mainly from Germany. Uh, we have a Hanseatic League and lots and lots of trade, a large urbanization, and we get the introduction of uh, other kinds of building, like building double framing with this German version of Stuhl, Stehende Stuhl. So uh, yeah, much happens. And yeah, I'll go on to the very short summary of results. Uh, today we know about, I must say today, much more than 600 medieval constructions, many of them still preserved, some fragmented. Uh, of these we have datings for more than 200, and we can pair with this date in 2007 when we had knowledge of 268 medieval roof constructions in Sweden, and uh, we had datings of 114. So uh, it's uh, more than double of the empirical material now in just a decade. You have an increased awareness of the roofs as important parts of the historic fabric of a building, which must be said has been quite neglected in, uh, for long in how it's been treated. Uh, it, we have also possibilities to enhance the medieval roofs as uh, something for a greater audience. And we have also done exhibitions and so on. Uh, our Finnish friends are making a documentary of that project. We are now being recorded. Uh, and of course, this is also, uh, these projects have been really an inspiration for making new contacts internationally and uh, networking. And it's very fun that we can all gather here today and have such a lovely time together. Thank you very much. Thank you for your inspiring talk, Robin. Um, I think we must go on directly here. And uh, I suggest if you have any uh, questions, we will try to catch it up later today. We have a summary uh, as our last post here, and I suggest you write it down and we come back to that. Our ne next lecture is, um, well, we are going to broaden the context a little bit here now. We are going uh, outside the Swedish borders to the northern Europe. And our next lecture is uh, Emeritus from the Warwick University, uh, just outside Coventry. And uh, Coventry is just in between Birmingham and Northampton. And uh, it's Nat Alcock that is going to talk uh, 
Nat, you are an author of several key publications in timber structures, vernacular architecture, and so on. And I remember when I was a student in Lund in the 1980s, we had recording timber frame uh, buildings on our desk. That was an obligatorium. So That's good. <laughs> now, now you may have it on your computer. We have yeah. that whole uh, glossary of terms available freely on the computer. Perfect. <laughs> I have it. You're going to talk about uh, Romanesque common tie beam room i uh, roof in Northern Europe, an overview. And you're very welcome. Thank you very much. And the first thing that I must say is that I'm most excited to be here. I'm looking forward to what we're going to be hearing, and I greatly appreciate the invitation. And my task is to introduce you to what I see as the key uh, to the development of medieval roofs in Northern Europe. And this is the common tie beam roof. As you see here, in fact, you've already seen this. This is Garda on uh, Gotland, which is very nice because in the church there is a ladder, not like uh, Robin's holes you have to crawl through. Um, and you can just go up and look at it. And it's also a characteristic uh, Gotland church. But I won't say any more about that. I should mention, though, uh, the name of Professor Lynn Courtney, my collaborator in our study of these roofs, uh, and also some of the main people who have given us information and shown us uh, these roofs. Patrick Hofsumer in Belgium, Frederick Ippo, who is here, is going to talk to us later, uh, and also in Sweden, particularly Robin and Kina Linskut. So I thank all uh, of these. Uh, firstly, what are common tie beam roofs. Well, we have here to make uh, a distinction between principal rafter roofs and common rafter roofs, where the principal rafter roofs have heavier trusses at intervals of bays uh, interspersed with lighter trusses, the common rafter trusses, whereas the common rafter roof has all its trusses of uniform size, uniform scantling, uh, without any division into bays. But then within the category of common rafter roofs, we have the common tie beam roof, which again has all the roof trusses the same, but in particular that each truss has uh, a tie beam. And you can see a couple of the tie beams at Garda, they're arrowed uh, uh, on the, the slide. Uh, and uh, the, for, well, I won't say much about the development of these roofs, but I will mention one point here, which is that they can develop, perhaps because of lack of timber, we find this particularly in England, into roofs where instead of having a tie beam at every truss, you have a tie beam at every other truss or perhaps every fourth truss, but without quite producing the proper full uh, uh, principal rafter roof. Now, these have long been recognized as standing at the beginning of the development of roof carpentry in uh, Western Europe. That is to say, uh, of course, we can only say this about the roofs that survive. What preceded them in the 9th, 8th, 7th century, well, uh, we don't know. Uh, and the dating has been uh, confirmed by a dendrochronology, the earliest coming from the beginning of the 11th century. Uh, as at the Church of St. Denis in Liège, dated by Patrick Hofsommer. And this is where uh, Lynn Courtney and I uh, came into this story. We were examining the form of the vanished original roof of the great Romanesque abbey of Jumiège in Normandy. And we could establish that this had been of common tie beam form. So to give this context, I compiled a database of as many of these roofs as I could identify from published examples and to some extent from personal information. And it's this data which under, underpins what I'm saying today. We were astonished by how many we were able to identify. Uh, we found 281 roofs in 250 buildings. Some churches, for example, have both nave and chancel of common tie beam form, but not necessarily of the same design, so we identify these as distinct uh, roofs. And it's worth mentioning that there were a notable number of these in Sweden. I have paid particular attention to the tree ring dating when this was available, and 
uh, quite strikingly, for about half of our examples, we do have uh, tree ring dates. So we're able to give a coherent uh, chronological framework to uh, these roofs. Uh, and as you see on the slide there, oh, sorry, on the image, the plan, uh, a handful come from the 11th century, the earliest, that one at Liège that I mentioned. A concentration in the 12th and then the 13th centuries uh, with a few later ones. In fact, there are even two uh, Swedish buildings with 17th century common tie beam roofs. The type is completely vanished by then, but what we think has gone on here is that they have rebuilt the roof in the 17th century and they have simply copied the uh, vanished medieval roof that preceded it. <coughs> uh, I should note though, and we will hear a bit more I think later, that uh, some of these dates uh, come from the early applications of dendrochronology and some of these uh, new and more detailed work is revising. So uh, you should always check to see if uh, a date that I have cited is still believed to be precisely correct. The overall pattern though is very clear uh, and very definite. The distribution that we identified uh, was a surprise much wider than we'd expected. Uh, we knew these roofs in France where we were investigating parallels for Jumiège, but uh, we found them extending through the Low Countries uh, and Germany uh, to Scandinavia. There are very few in England, a disappointment uh, to me, but uh, that's how it turned out, and it's an interesting <coughs> story in itself, which I think I won't have really time to go into. Uh, and there are a few obvious patterns. For example, we can see here uh, a number of 13th century roofs from Norway. And I'm sure when we hear from uh, Olaf Storsleten, we will uh, know more about those. But I must emphasize that this map shows what we found for our database uh, from sources in the literature and from uh, information that people kindly provided. Uh, since then, I've seen reports of churches with common tie beam roofs, uh, one in Poland and one in Romania. Uh, they're both from the 14th century and how are dated, but I wonder whether there may be more to be discovered or maybe that is already known from uh, further east in Europe than the area which we covered. And there I have to say, <laughs> I've not tried to uh, search the literature to uh, try and establish this but I think we need to look at the possibility of a further uh, extent uh, to the east. There is one more that's marked on that map. Uh, we'll come back to that in a little, in a little while. Uh, some specific points I should make. Most of these roofs are on churches, but I haven't restricted the database to churches, and there are houses particularly reported from Germany. The, uh, Lack of examples in England probably relates to the dates of the surviving roofs, which uh, post-date generally uh, the time when common tie beam roofs were particularly being constructed. Most of these are buildings with stone walls. We've heard about the, the churches with their stone walls, but some have timber frames and a few others, including uh, churches with stave built walls. Now, I want to look now more closely at the roofs themselves. Uh, individual roof trusses have a variety of designs uh, and we see these on this and the following uh, image. Uh, in order to uh, classify them in the database, I gave each type uh, a code uh, so that we could assign them and easily uh, uh, sort them out in uh, our database. Uh, here are the first two uh, types, which are those which have the struts at an angle, canted, or the struts vertical. Uh, and then with those uh, there, you can combine these, uh, sometimes with a collar, sometimes without, and also uh, sometimes with a central strut, a king strut or a king post, or sometimes without. So that gives you a variety of uh, types, but the 
principal distinction is between those with the slanting struts and the vertical struts. If we go on from there to the next type here, uh, we see uh, what I've called C, the name is quite arbitrary, uh, the lattice truss, where we have uh, struts uh, crossing over to produce a lattice of one form or another. We find uh, somewhat similar to this uh, a type which I've called P because it has parallel rafters, just a pair of rafters paralleling the main rafters of the, uh, the truss. And occasionally those with scissor braces, they're not very common those. And finally, uh, those which don't have any trusses at all, just have a common tie beams and rafters. And uh, in case you worry, uh, there are only two which I can't fit into this category, so that's two and 250. Uh, the cate the categorization works fairly well, but we do have quite a large group where we can't put them into this category because we don't know what they are. Uh, usually, these are roofs where we've only got the tie beams preserved or we've got fragments that don't uh, make a pattern that we can distinguish. Let's go on and look at these in a little bit more detail. Here are the uh, roofs uh, with um, uh, canted struts or with vertical struts and the distributions of these. They're both, uh, well, particularly the canted struts are the, the commonest uh, of all, uh, widely uh, distributed. Uh, 96 examples over the whole of the region in which uh, common tie beam roofs have been identified. Those with vertical struts are more concentrated uh, in northern France, uh, Belgium, and this example that I show here is at Soigny, uh, the Collégial de Saint-Vincent, and uh, we'll see a little bit more about that later on. Uh, I'll come back to look at the lattice truss, which comes next in sequence, but uh, here are some of the less common types. Here, uh, those with parallel uh, rafters, which are particularly uh, found among those Norwegian churches, with a few in western Sweden. Uh, the scissor braces, relatively rare, uh, and the ones which just have tie beams and rafters, slightly more common, uh, but this is actually particularly interesting because uh, of one example here, and this is the church of Hagia Paraskevi in Greece. Now, maybe this is telling us that there is a whole uh, family of common tie beam roofs moving down towards uh, Greece, but in fact that isn't quite the case. Uh, the picture here is very dark, but you can maybe see the tie beams, and it has a date of uh, 1222, uh, but after that. And also particularly interesting, the tie beams are of alpine larch. And so uh, the date tells us that this is uh, Western, not Byzantine. Uh, it is after the point at period in uh, 1209 when the Venetians conquered uh, Greece, and they have built themselves, it's been now identified as a Dominican convent and they have brought in the timber and no doubt the carpenters from places where they knew they could get good timber and good carpenters. So not Greek but a part of the common tie beam tradition uh, relatively uh, late uh, moving down uh, with the con conquerors there. I've left the lattice truss uh, type C till last in this little survey because it's particularly intriguing and also relevant to early roofs uh, in Sweden. It's the second most numerous type with 86 examples and found exclusively in Sweden and Denmark, apart from one remarkably in central France. You can see the drawing at the bottom showing this truss at Chabris in the department of Indre in France. Uh, this isn't dated, but the masonry suggests the 12th century. A little bit frustrating, the roof was visible during a restoration in the 1950s, 
and is now sealed off and nobody has ever been able to get back again into it to uh, take tree ring samples. There is a considerable variety in the truss designs, as you can see, but no obvious correlation between the design and the date. And a few, like this one in the bottom, uh, have uh, collars, uh, and that one comes from uh, Denmark. We don't know why this one French example is there, but it is so similar to the Swedish ones that my feeling is that it might actually have been the work of Swedish carpenters. I, I can't quite see why, if it's there, there aren't more, if it's the French carpenters, uh, but I have no uh, historical suggestion as to why there might be a Swedish carpenter in the partner of Arndt in the 12th century. I want to finish with one other question. Were these open roofs or did they carry ceilings? Of course, close set tie beams are ideal for ceiling boards. Uh, when we look at the dramatically decorated roof trusses at Joachim, we've seen these already uh, in just glimpses uh, in Western Sweden, uh, it has three forms of decorated lattice truss and surely these were designed to be seen even if looking from the nave of the church they would have been uh, in a uh, somewhat gloomy tip there. But look at this, the spectacular painted ceiling of Silis in Switzerland, a common tie beam roof of 1097 and a ceiling dated itself to 1115. Well, uh, clearly this was a church that was sealed. And see also again the uh, same view that I showed you before of the roof of Soigny in Belgium where we see grooves for ceiling panels in the tie beams. So these were sealed roofs and I've been told that just out there is the only known example of common tie beams in a Swedish roof which also have grooves for ceiling beams. So they also used um, uh, sealed roofs here in Sweden. I'll just leave you uh, while I go on to finish off with uh, a close-up of the roof at Zillis to uh, enjoy. And uh, I'll tell you finally what I think we can say about these common tie beams roof, roofs. They are the oldest identified roof type in Northern Europe. They're distributed from France to Scandinavia and also, it seems, uh, further east. They date from the 11th century, the 12th, and sometimes as late as the 15th century. There are a variety of truss designs. Some are regional, for example, uh, in Norway. Others much more widely distributed. And they are found as both open and sealed roofs. Well, I hope that during this conference we will hear more about them and understand perhaps more about these and the other types of medieval roof trusses that we are recognizing in Sweden and elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nat, for this interesting talk. I think we have some minutes for questions here, so maybe we should take the opportunity. Somebody wants to ask Nat anything about this topic that has... Yes, you... <laughs> uh, uh, just a comment, uh, my name is Carl Tillin, just a comment concerning uh, old roof trusses in Eastern Europe. Uh, I, I made, uh, I stayed some time in Romania and they said that almost everything was destroyed by Genghis Khan. So that's why they don't have <laughs> anything that old uh, <laughs> there. But maybe they're not right, but that was just a well, comment. Well, one there. example was said to be the oldest church in Romania, uh, and it's of the mid 14th century. I don't offhand remember when Genghis Khan was riding around. Uh, 13th century. Right, <laughs> so that's after that. <laughs> Uh, 
Anybody else that wants to talk, have a question? Nat, do we know anything about uh, the abandonment of these uh, trusses? Uh, can we relate it to what's happening in the church room, actually? Uh, I think we can say two things about that. One is that they are very intensive in their use of timber. And if timber resources are difficult to obtain or are decreasing, then you will need to think of something else for your roofs, and particularly mm -hmm. perhaps omitting some of the tie beams will do that. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is that uh, they can be difficult to use when you start putting in stone vaults, either when you are building churches mm -hmm. with stone vaults or, as very often happened, when you are inserting stone vaults into an earlier church. And these will often go up and will force the common tie beams mm -hmm. to be cut through for the vault. Mm -hmm. And of course, if that is happening, then it's a waste of time to put a common tie beam move in. You will instead use one uh, with tie beams matching mm -hmm. the spacing of the vault. Thank you. You said something also about uh, that you found this uh, common tie beam in secular buildings in the continent. What yeah. kind of buildings is that? Is it town halls or uh, castles? The ones that I know of, and maybe we will hear more about this from the people speaking from Germany, are um, townhouses, yes, mm. and timber framed townhouses with common tie beam roofs on the top of the timber frames. Mm. We have one Engl English example, uh, which is a stone house of the 12th century, uh, but again a secular one. This is in Lincoln. Uh, the so-called Jews house in Lincoln has mm. a roof, uh, sorry, it has tie beams from a roof of this form. The upper roof has disappeared. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Nato. Could it be that the tie beam actually once was more common in the in, in Britain, but uh, not preserved in that uh, amount? Because I read something about quite interesting fragments in the Church of Adel outside of York that it looked really like a Scandinavian style that's roof. Ab that's absolutely right. Adel in Yorkshire yeah. uh, is. Uh, one of our few examples where we really know that it was a common tie beam roof of the classic type. Uh, it was destroyed, it was replaced in the 1830s, but kindly somebody drew it yeah, before yeah. the replacement. So, yeah. yes. So, it's a big intriguing place I would like to visit once uh, sometime. Church, <laughs> I recommend anybody who is there in South Yorkshire to go and see it. Okay. Right, I think we move on then. Thank you yes. so much, Nat. Well, thank you, and uh, our next speaker is from Germany, Thilo Schöfbeck. Welcome. You're a Bauforger in the enterprise Bauforger, but also a scholar with uh, expertise in building archaeology, dendrochronology, and brick works. But now you will share your expertise in, in timber constructions in medieval Mecklenburg, northern Germany. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I hope everybody can understand. Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you much, very much for the invitation. I come from a rich landscape, not rich in the material sense, rather in the architectural historical sense. After the so-called German Eastern Settlement, Deutsche Ostsiedlung, uh, it's a part of colonization uh, from the west to the east, and Christianization, Mecklenburg and Pomerania developed into prosperous countries in the Middle Ages. But after the Middle Ages, not so much happened. The Hanseatic League was a driving force and in modern times, Mecklenburg and New Pomerania 
rested in a slumber. That is also a reason why the medieval churches have came down to modern times so authentically. That's a little bit similar, similar to Sweden, I think, uh, the, the condition of the old uh, constructions is really amazing. Quite every parish church has at least one construction, many of them abo above all uh, nave and tower and uh, sanctuary. Here you can see not the most recent um, map of um, preserved uh, churches, uh, roof constructions. In, yeah, I, I took all Me Mecklenburg and uh, Pomer Western Pomerania. Now it's a federal state in Germany. You know the eastern part is now in Poland. So, and after yeah, doing my PhD, um, I, I was collecting, yeah, I think, hundreds. You see um, quite now more than 300 um, dated uh, timber constructions. And I did such a curve um, about construction activities based on dendrochronological dates. And what you see, the, the um, beams are um, the, uh, in, the, in the decades or uh, the builded uh, roofs or builded parts of the churches. And uh, the other thing, it's Stralsund and Rostock, this are, these are results from archaeology and um, it's correlating, interesting. Uh, in, and we have development with a peak, big peak, and we have a big valley in that area. So it's the beginning of the crisis, the agrarian crisis in the late uh, medieval times, late Middle Ages. But uh, to start with the first, uh, with the ancestors, um, when I began uh, to research, um, no wooden church was, uh, was be known in, in northern Germany, nothing. I began as an archaeologist and I thought maybe I can start to to excavate in churches, but better not, I found in the roofs the uh, relics of wooden churches, as we heard. So that's my first, um, yes, this is my first wooden church. <laughs> it's a quite common um, medieval, late medieval uh, church, and I never thought that I could find, I think it's, yeah, uh, I couldn't find it in. I, I didn't know, but I found some planks. And it's a normal late Gothic scissor brace roof, as it is very, very common in uh, northern Germany. And the reused parts of the Stave Church. Um, more uh, pictures, you see it's a sketch, only a sketch, and you see the, the uh, reused timber of a gable, for instance, and um, you see the planks, the first planks, and it was, uh, has been dated on to 1243. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it fits to uh, settlement history in this area. Uh, the name of the village Lase uh, means uh, the village in the, uh, in the yeah, wood, in the forest, um, it's, uh, you know, it's a Slavonian uh, language, a Slavonian landscape in, in this uh, part eastern of the Elbe. And, oh, sorry. Um, the interesting thing would be if we could de excavate, maybe we could found uh, could find this uh, way as we uh, as the colleagues found in Gotland in not far away in Sirte. I've been there and it's really 
uh, interesting that uh, you found the, um, um, the fundament, the, uh, the grounding, and you found um, the shape on the, ga um, the sanctuary, and uh, you found timber, um, and you could date it. I think it's, it was normal to build the massive um, church around uh, the um, wooden church. A colleague of mine found this decorative um, plate, uh, upper plate of a stave church um, in western Mecklenburg. It's dated around 1200, it's no bark, no, uh, no rainy edge, but um, the sketch is a, a reconstruction sketch. And I th don't know if there are um, uh, stave churches known in the south of Baltics before. The other thing uh, for timber construction was that uh, I found many provisional uh, wooden gables in the churches and in the churches from the 13th and uh, early 14th century, really good constructions, n no planks, no boards on it, but um, I found, as you see here, that in, uh, in Western, uh, in, in Niedersachsen, Lower Saxony, you found the uh, construction of this gable, and these are the reconstruction, uh, how it worked. So maybe we have a view into timber construction of 13th century. And um, we are lucky to find yeah, um, petrified uh, wooden churches, um, half timbered churches, petrified and uh, in the wall of stone, of brick churches. So on the island of Rügen, the oldest one is in Lando, I discovered uh, some years ago. And um, after years of not using the church, the plaster fell down and what you see are the, um, um, the uh, the, the, the timber, the vertical timber of the uh, half-timbered um, church. You see it's um, dated 1312, immured in the 15th century, and um, typically, um, I think, uh, uh, is the, are the uh, horizontal um, uh, rails, lapped rails, and uh, long braces. Yeah, you found some, uh, you see some traces of it. They are not preserved, and yeah, I hope in future I can measure and research further. I show you not the oldest uh, church in, in the landscape. It's from it's Lübo. It's um, from dated back to 1210. Mm -hmm. It's a typical um, roof with um, scholars uh, and I show you Neukloster uh, Neu Abbey. It's a new monastery. Um, the church dated back to the middle of the 13th century. And as you can see, it's um, yeah, a construction with uh, tie beam. Um, it's a uh, yeah, principal rafter truss um, with uh, schisser traces uh, and the joints are really typical for the early 13th century. You 
you see the uh, edge marks um, as carpenter uh, signs, carpenter marks. And um, I don't know uh, if you found such traces in, in uh, Scandinavian roofs, uh, traces of uh, carpenter's letters. Um, uh, I see. <laughs> I see. <laughs> um, in Neukloster, um, 1250, uh, we, uh, we find it in every fifth um, um, right, uh, rafter, both sides. You can see it on the uh, drawing here. And the funny thing is the uh, upper color beam, um, it's really um, not horizontal. But I think it's a uh, following um, mistake uh, by measuring and by uh, making a um, yeah, schablone um, uh, a pattern. It's the only thought about it. Um, a view inside the, the um, roof, it's the one of the oldest roofs in northern Germany um, using scissors. Um, another thing uh, I found in uh, <laughs> in late in late Gothic times, uh, maybe the first drawings of um, medieval yeah roof construction is uh, really um, original drawings. Uh, in the Hall Church in Grimmen in Western Pomerania, in, uh, dated back to 1456. And I've been there together with restorers, and we are sure it's these are, uh, drawings are authentically authentical. And what you see are two uh, yeah, construction, late Gothic constructions, maybe of half timbered. Um, houses and you know there are similarities to hall churches this is a hall church so i uh, think it's really interesting because we don't have any drawings uh, for brick churches for the big uh, cathedrals big, the big churches of the hanseatic league and here we found it uh, some sketches from the middle of uh, 15th century Another sketch I found uh, in Bützow Church in, it, in the um, tower construction, and I'm sure it's authentical from dated back to 1457. <coughs> it's in uh, graffiti. Going inside one uh, of the most important um, constructions in, in, the, in northern Germany, it's the area where you know, the big hall, uh, hall roofs, hall constructions were developed in the uh, 13th century. And we have a look into the Bützow um, church. It's a, um, um, oh, I'm sorry, um, yeah, a church from 14th century and 15th century and uh, as you see the red sign, it's the original parts from uh, 1314. And the interesting thing is that uh, they used um, different signs from different um, um, tools for every joint. So uh, they had more than 900 different signs in one roof construction. It's really yeah, <laughs> dangerous to sign it, that all. And here it's only a part of this. Um, we, we see it's an experimental phase of uh, building such uh, roof, roof construction. Um, the oldest, they are dating back to the, to the uh, 1280s only uh, 
as reused timber. And from this um, construction, we come to the um, to belfries. Um, as you know, these um, from Modena, um, it's a very common construction of uh, belf uh, of these towers for war machines um, and uh, for church uh, for belfries as well, and. Um, I found uh, some in, in uh, northern Germany too. You saw, see such a drawing here in the church in Ankershagen in 14th or 15th century. We don't know exactly on the right side a drawing of um, a Danish uh, uh, tower. Uh, Elna Möller uh, was researching um, in the 15th and 16th uh, years of the last century. But in the last years I could re do researches on many of these um, towers. So we could uh, date it back now to the oldest standing one in uh, on the left, uh, Neuboltenhagen. It's not far away from Greifswald. Uh, it's really standing, preserved from back to uh, 1266. I found reused uh, from the 1230s, but it's not s still standing. And so you see, uh, I think some dozen of, um, of belfries preserved. And uh, not immersed uh, and not petrified, uh, the oldest standing half timber church, it's, uh, not far away from Schwerin, the capital of Mecklenburg and Western Pomerania. It's Konzrade. Uh, it's dated uh, 1470, and from the outside, you could never uh, think it's a medieval church, but inside because of the joints and of the carpenter marks and of dendrochronology at least. But um, what's happening if uh, the forests, the timber is empty? That's the problem of Hanseatic League uh, towns and the area around beginning from the 1270s, they are starting to import timber from the whole Baltic area. Not uh, the very north Sweden part, it's more or less in the 19th century, but in the medieval it comes from, uh, from Danzig and uh, from uh, Memel and Riga. Um, and it's gone from a show. And we can uh, locate it by dendrochronology. Maybe you know the uh, Danziger uh, copper ship. Um, it's dated back to 1399. And um, there, the archaeologists could find um, the planks um, of Wainscott, Wagenschutt of uh, the um, tim imp uh, export timber from uh, Baltics and Poland. I think you know how to split uh, such an oak trunk. And um, this version was uh, exported to yeah whole Europe coastline. Um, The thing you find and you know are different types of carpenter's marks. Not uh, trade marks here, carpenter's marks. It's an overview of different uh, types from 13th to 16th century. But back to, to trade. The first 
der äh, äh, alten Kirche, der äh, oldest church, äh, the second oldest church on the island of Rügen. I found the oldest um, traces of rafting. I don't know in Baltic area, I don't know, but it's, it's dating back to 1262 and I know not uh, traces of bind, uh, bindings uh, from 13th century and from Sweden all imported uh, timber from Sweden and Finland, I found is without this um, binding. The difference between, in, in quality between um, timber up and uh, for instance in um, Lapish, uh, Lapland uh, timber, you can imagine and we saw that twice. And uh, timber trade in the southern uh, Baltic area, mostly with uh, rafters, maybe rafters um, uh, around or on the, or the coastline. And these are the uh, relics of uh, the rest of the findings, uh, of the bindings. You know that the way of uh, binding with uh, Wiede and Keil, uh, the, the upper uh, graphic and a reconstruction in Bad Winsheim in, uh, in Franconia. The only church with um, a medieval church with medieval imported timber from Sweden I found in the coastline of Pomerania uh, in the western part not far away from Stralsund is uh, Flemendorf and the roof construction is complete imported from Sweden and it See, it's the only one um, with trademarks. I don't know if anybody knows such trademarks from Middle Ages in Scandinavia, but for me it was the first time. Because especially the island of Rügen has many, many of these trademarks, but the timber there is coming from local area around in, in Pomerania. And at le uh, for the last, I will show you a special um, yeah, development of um, roof construction. If there is not tim enough timber with the length for hall churches, they began in 14th century to develop um, the vertical. Um, yeah, wall, not made of timber, uh, made of bricks. So after war, you saw the, this uh, wall in, in New Brandenburg, and in two churches um, in Pomerania, it's preserved this construction. And on the right. One, it's a whole, uh, it's a hall roof, but they were changing the construction in the beginning of 18th century. That's why it looks like a basilica, but it's, it, it is not a basilica. It has been under one big roof. Have a look inside these hall constructions. It's not like Bützow, where it, everything is made of timber. Here you have a church above the church. You have um, a construction from the time around 1370. That's the time where uh, we do have um, a real lack of timber, of long timber. Not the timber everywhere, but not long timber for rafters. And um, so they decided to build this construction. You see, it's a drawing by my colleague um,
Thorsten Rütz from Greifswald. And the second example is um, Triebsees. Um, it's in Pomerania as well. And uh, you saw, see the type of basilica uh, roof now. It's Baroque, but um, as you might see, the uh, frame of brick work, brick walls, it's the same. And in parish churches, the uh, development or the solution it's quite similar. For instance, Kalkhorst in Western North Western Europe, not far away from Wismar and Lübeck. Um, have a look inside. You see it's a step hall and they build it because they couldn't build a hall construction, but as you see uh, they built something with um, air rafters and uh, jack rafters. They are joined, uh, connected the rafters because of the big length. And that's my journey. Thank you for listening and for the invitation to Uppsala. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tilo. Very in intriguing cases, a detective work, a paradigmal clues. I guess we have uh, questions here. We will have a coffee break in uh, five minutes. But uh, there are time for some questions. Yeah. <coughs> oh, once again, thanks for we had very nice visits to Mecklenburg and some of your favorite churches. And I was struck by the large uh, similarities between what's preserved there and what you find in Denmark and what was once Denmark in Sweden uh, in the constructions and also the way of handling the timbers. You could often see how they first had blocked the timber with axe but then parted them with saw twice or once or twice in halves or quarters. Uh, and it's something that appears in this time of this uh, high conjuncture of uh, around 1300 or something? Uh, uh, it appears first in Neu Kloster you saw, um, 1250 exact dated. Um, at first I wanted to show, I forgot it. Uh, but it begins and we don't know where it comes from and from this time up, it's normal to make yeah, quarter, uh, quarter timber, quarter timber, um, yeah, all the time to, to use a saw, but not before. I don't know. Is it uh, economization, trying to get more out of each timber? I think so, because um, all of the roof constructions of Mecklenburg are made of um, oak, some of ash. But not not many of um, t of uh, pine, and in Pomerania, it's depending to um, natural conditions. There are more pine constructions, but um, maybe because of the big oaks, uh, they uh, decided to make quartered timber. Yes, for instance, in in Bützow, we have timber with four um, f faces uh, sawn. Thank you. And more question. You touch upon subjects, uh, the dendrochronological references that you showed that will be maybe brought up later on here by um, Friedrich. But uh, do we have any more questions here? Maybe on tool marks or the reconstruction of the gables? We don't have Kina Linscott here, but she made a point or a hypothesis on visible gables in this lattice work in the old churches. 
but she's not here, unfortunately. <laughs> she couldn't come. No, too bad. Are you uh, craving for coffee? Is that <laughs> Okay, <laughs> we shall not hold you. Uh, <laughs> so please uh, take a coffee break. 30 minutes, we will be here starting the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you.